Good morgen. That's about it for me in German. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I, I didn't think I was going to make it because of the U.S. Uh, passport control, but fortunately they didn't think I was a terrorist after all, and I'm here. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about avant-garde magazines, but the term avant-garde is a little misleading because you're avant-garde for about a minute and then you're guard. Uh, the avant uh, just dis dissipates. This is based on a book that I've done, I think it's out with Soda, called Mares to Emigre and Beyond, Avant-Garde Magazine Design of the 20th Century. And the idea come, came from a life of love of magazines, and also seeing those magazines, uh, at least in the United States, kind of dissipate and move into niche areas and uh, uh, the digital realm. So when you look at these images, because there's not enough time to really go into great detail about them, uh, when you look at these images, the premise behind the selection is that they changed the way magazines were designed. First they did it on a small scale, and then that got put into the main major culture, into the mainstream. So I start with one of your own, Jugend, which uh, was the first, along with Simplicissimus, of the Jugendstil magazines. And the idea of changing a logo was pretty new at the time. Jugend may not have been the only one of that era, but it certainly was the most profound. And breaking the page grid, uh, the strict grid that is imposed by the, the chase in a, in a letterpress printer uh, was done as well with mortises and, and the like. Uh, so th these pages actually come back to haunt us many decades afterward. But at the time, there was a great relief, there was a great liberation of the page thanks to them. This is Mother Earth. And Mother Earth was uh, edited by Emma Goldman, who was a Russian immigre to the United States, uh, who, if you've seen the movie Reds, appears as Maureen Stapleton, uh, played by Maureen Stapleton. She created a, an underground newspaper, uh, underground magazine, uh, in the early part of the century that got her uh, deported from the U.S. So magazines... Uh, the, the magazines I'm showing you have changed the design landscape, but also their content is very important and often wed to their design. This is Bradbury, his book, Bradley, his book. Uh, Bradley was a type designer, uh, a layout man, and a poster artist in the United States who brought Art Nouveau, or Jugendstil, into uh, the American... Uh, sphere. Those, he did a book, his, this book, which was a long, narrow, letterpressed uh, magazine um, that was basically self-promotion, but at the same time, he was promoting design. He was one of the advocates of graphic design when it was still uh, a function of printers. And that's one of his ads on the uh, Verso page. Um, but also... Uh, this was an extraordinary book, and, and many of the so-called avant-garde books and booklets were uh, uh, created as self-promotional things. Versacrum, the uh, Vienna Secession magazine, this by Coleman Moser, uh, also changed the way typography was perceived and the way magazines were perceived. So these were indie magazines, uh, at the nascence of indie magazine, Ing, and they were also the internet of their day. And I'll tell you more about that later. But here you can see a page that's totally radical. There's, no, there's white space. So this may not have been the first to offer white space to the world, but it was certainly one of the more profound. And Poesia was uh, a magazine that was edited by F.T. Marinetti, 
uh, in which he introduces the whole Futurist Manifesto. And while it has that uh, symbolist look about it, it leads directly into Futurist typography and ultimately into the new typography. The Futurists were uh, anti-establishment, anti-bourgeois. They were also ultimately fascist. And their publications kind of re represent the uh, aesthetic of Italian fascism. So just because something looks good, it doesn't mean it reads good. But it did look good. Uh, Enrico Prempolini, one of the uh, futurist uh, leaders, created Noi, Us. And that went head-to-head -head with a magazine like this one, Revi uh, the ABC Revista, the Darte, but it also influenced the Giovanuto Fascista, which was the magazine of the young fascist legion, uh, like the Boy Scouts, uh, and those, their covers were extremely progressive, which is another synonym for avant-garde in this context. But here's something I love as avant-garde, it's the enemy. Uh, and what's great about this is it's hand-lettered. Uh, the middle portion of the, uh, the cover is totally empty. That's, of course, where usually in mainstream magazines you get the target image. And uh, not only that, it looks as though somebody could have done it yesterday, when in fact it was 1927. Another one of your own magazines, Diaccion, uh, was a very forthright left-wing political magazine uh, that came out of the Expressionist movement. It lasted for quite a while, though, so its avant-gardedness uh, dissipated pretty quickly. But it still holds up as a, a paradigm of uh, this kind of uh, aggressive magazine. And this is the new masses. In the United States, we had our own avant-garde uh, percolating. Uh, there was a magazine called The Masses, which was uh, discontinued because it was, as the government said, seditious uh, because of a few cartoons that criticized American involvement in World War I. Uh, but it was also, uh, it restarted again after the war as the new masses, and it introduced uh, cubism and expressionism and other I modern isms uh, to the magazine field. What's also wonderful about a magazine like this and any indie magazine is that you don't have to put those damn cover lines on the cover. And you didn't even have to put a flap on if you wanted to keep the cover pure. The New Yorker is the only magazine that continues to do that that has any mainstream appeal. Uh, Hugh Hefner wasn't the only one to do Playboy. Uh, in fact, I did an interview with Hugh Hefner a number of years ago, and I asked him whether he saw this magazine before he started his own. And his own magazine was supposed to be called Stag Party. And instead of a bunny, it was going to be a deer as the, uh, with horns. Get it? A horny d deer. Uh, and he said, yeah, I think I saw the Playboy, but that's not why we called it Playboy. And I said, I don't believe you. And he said, that's the end of the interview. <laughs> uh, Cabaret Voltaire leads off the early 20s with the uh, Dada movement. And whatever you say about the Dadas, they uh, were major magazine producers, major indie producers. And this is where the internet comes in. These magazines were distributed often by hand to various countries, from Switzerland, from Germany, uh, throughout Eastern Europe. And the magazine became this network. There were many different magazines, as you'll see in a moment. But the magazine became that way of exchanging artistic uh, understanding, artistic knowledge, artistic theory, agitational propaganda. Uh, it was ultimately redesigned, so it had more of a magazine-y look, but it changed every issue, which certainly had an influence later on with punk magazines. 
using uh, typecase materials, using old wood types. You all have probably seen these. Uh, but to look at them in the context of today and what can be done on the computer is really fascinating. This is one that actually was never really published, uh, an anthology of some of the data magazine works. This is Francis Picabia. Everybody who had something to say published a magazine. So in that sense, it was like a blog or a uh, fanzine. And uh, if you were an artist and you wanted to uh, express yourself on a mass level, the magazine was the best thing to do because it could travel very easily. And Picabia's 291, which was, uh, I always thought, a, uh, a kind of jab at the Steichen's 391 uh, gallery um, is actually quite an amazing magazine because he was peripatetic. Uh, a, a word, by the way, I learned from Roger Black about 25 years ago. Thanks, Roger. I use it a lot. <laughs> uh, he, um, he would publish what, in whatever city he was in. So he published a number of issues, not on any uh, schedule, but uh, whenever he felt like it. Uh, the Blind Man was uh, uh, I have these senior moments where I can't remember names. Duchamp. See, I got to it by thinking about coffee and then I thought about a champ and how I got from coffee to a champ, I don't know. But uh, Duchamp did a number of magazines when he was in New York practicing what would be called New York data. And The Blind Man was one of them. And it was, uh, it's where he described what his found objects were all about and where he introduced his A. Mutt uh, alter ego. He also published Wrong Wrong, uh, which uses that matchbook on the cover, which uh, in the 1990s and, and 2000s, uh, was something that would be called vernacular and used as a stylistic conceit. This is his New York Data magazine, which is based on a box of his uh, Cabinet of Wonders. And what I love about this magazine more than anything else is that somebody actually had to type this. They didn't have computer or justification tools from IBM at that time. Uh, there were a variety of other data publications like Bulletin D, which uh, could easily be seen today in magazines, in some of those alternative magazines that we saw the other day. Uh, data Jazz, uh, which came out of Zagreb. Every Eastern European city had a data group. Uh, Theo van Duisburg produced uh, Nakano which was basically an, a folded sheet uh, that you unfolded. And the, f the three issues that existed had different colored opening sheets, all in the, uh, the De Stiel range of colors. And then here's Mertz, uh, Schwitter's, Kurt Schwitter's magazine. And probably many of you know the story. He, w he saw an ad for Commerce Bank and cut off the com, or cut off the co, and ended up with Mertz. And this is one where he uh, uh, shared uh, the designing with El Lizitsky. So from here, where it's kind of free form, to here, where he puts in rules, the world changed. Because all of a sudden, you have constructivism in magazines. And the new typography is beginning to take off. And basically, Meritz was just a self-promotional tool uh, so that he could sell his advertising services. Another of the great magazines, and if you like record covers, it's also a terrific record cover uh, for 33s, is Vendigen, uh, which came out of Holland and was the other side of the, the De Stille modernism, uh, a little more in the Art Nouveau realm, but at the same time, very hard-edged. And every one of their 125 covers 
uh, changed because there were different artists working on them. So that's another Vendigan. Uh, you wouldn't even know it was the cover of Vendigan, except it says so. And then another peripatetic magazine was Broom, which was published in Paris and New York. Uh, this is Fernand Leger. And uh, Broom covers were all done as wood blocks, and then the interior was stitched together. And it has a great tactility. That's the other thing about these magazines, because you didn't have to worry about commercial printing constraints. Uh, there was a great feeling to them. I always love the way printing terms echo our erotic desires, like the kiss of type or the matrix and the patrix, making the type, which is a child, which suggests to me love and, and, and other things. This was also done as a, a, a woodblock, uh, Het Overzicht from Belgium. And then probably many of you know uh, Every Man His Own Football, which came out of the Moloch Verlag, uh, which was the press of uh, Wieland Hersfeld, John Hartfield, and George Gross, and that's uh, John Hartfield's first political collage. So another aspect of avant-gardism is that there are firsts. Uh, that can also be said for mainstream magazines as well. I remember when Esquire did its an issue with electronic paper, and it was the first, but it was the first of a very bad idea. The uh, Plaita, which has George Gross's work in it, was also a highly political publication that required a, uh, a registration with the government to publish, so they had to circumvent certain rules. Uh, you could say that circumventing of uh, official dicta uh, is an avant-garde event. This is a magazine that kind of collected the avant-garde, Social Kunst, that came out of uh, Scandinavia. And Rodchenko, certainly in the Soviet Union during that first, that early period of the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, there were, his, you know, the, the stories that come out of there in terms of the radicalism of art uh, manifest not only in painting uh, and sculpture and paper architecture, but also in magazines. And this is Lef magazine, which lasted for about a year and a half before uh, the government cl clamped down on it. This is a Polish magazine called Block. This one is one of these great full broadsheet magazines. You, you can't even tell from this image, but in fact, that image is probably the size of the magazine. Uh, it was huge, it was done in part with type case materials, uh, all black and white, and, but they didn't sit on their black and white laurels, they also did this, which is the basis for the cover of the book, and they also did this collage, which uh, looks as though, again, it could have been done yesterday. This is uh, uh, Ma from Hungary, which was part of a, their avant-garde movement. An Integral from Romania. Uh, the type there is all made with type case materials. Zenit from the Czech Republic, or from Czechoslovakia. Victor Browner who created his own magazine called 75 HP, which included these uh, poetic uh, typographic uh, compositions that he became known for. So the magazines were also expressions of t complete individuals, where Schwitter's early issues were all Schwitter's, then he started bringing in others to contribute and be part of his group. But these magazines were in that even though they were rigidly composed, they ultimately were uh, kind of anarchic. And then we get into something where rigidity and standardization begins, and that's the Bauhaus. And Herbert Beyer did that cover, which is one of the early v uses of montage 
uh, in a kind of faux trump loy three-dimensional setting. And the Bauhaus, uh, in a sense, gives us the grid that we revere so highly. Use Schmidt. And here's where the grid really becomes dominant. You see everything in a rational, organized way, but it doesn't look like anything that was out on the newsstand at the time. And that's what made it alternative, and it made it progressive, and it made it avant-garde. We heard a lot about Das Neue Frankfurt yesterday, and just on the surface quality alone, it's a beautifully done magazine. And for me, making the number of the magazine so prominent was a, uh, a wonderful uh, bit of hubris. And this is ABC, an architectural magazine, another architectural magazine, Elizitsky's Objet in three languages. And of course, that cover is quintessentially constructivist. Sander Boit, uh, Bortnik's uh, Hungarian magazine, Uzi Fold, uh, where the image really is reduced simply to those lines. And this is tank one and a half. I love the idea of doing a half an issue. Subscribers would be pissed off. <laughs> and now we're coming to one of my favorites of that period, Jemmy, which was actually a mainstream magazine. It was a lifestyle magazine from Czechoslovakia, and it was designed by Ladislav Sutnar. Uh, this year I got uh, a doctorate in his name. So please, if anybody wants to talk to me, doctor is the proper uh, salutation. Hey, doc, won't do. But uh, he was able to take a, a magazine that was sold through news dealers and do it like the magazines that came before that were sold by hand to groups. There are no real cover lines on this whatsoever. Here's another example of his work. And he did different series of these magazines. So this one uh, is totally different. And what I also love about this magazine is that it basically says, uh, fuck you to magazine covers. Because he's, there's so much empty space. Think about covers today. You can't have empty space. This is also a Czech publication uh, designed, edited by Carol Tiga called Red. And although Carol Tiga was left, I don't think Red had to do with communism. And this is one of the most interesting of his issues, photofilm typo, uh, recognizing that typography was part of the modern arts. This is less a magazine than it is an annual or a biannual designed by Pete Svart. Uh, it was Filmkunst, and each issue uh, represented a different film culture from a different country. And then left the magazine that folded that uh, Alexander Rodchenko was producing, uh, ultimately became Neue Left, or New Left. And his design changed somewhat. First of all, it went to a kind of lower case from that heavy slab serif that he was using. And there's more sense of constructivist and photographic uh, composition here. And he was taking photos at the time, so he was introducing that as part of his repertoire. What's interesting with the next piece, USSR and Construction, is that so many avant-garde designers worked on it that it could be mistaken for an avant-garde journal. Uh, and f bits of it are. Uh, this issue was devoted exclusively to Mayakovsky, who had killed himself. Uh, probably because he couldn't get on the cover of construct USSR and constructivism. 
in construction, I mean. Uh, it has some of his Rasta windows in it, and it also was designed by his friend El Lazitsky, using this kind of documentary collage style, uh, which was consistent with pictorial magazines of that era, but went a step beyond, uh, certainly in terms of its uh, positioning on the page. Le Corbusier had his own indie magazine, L'Esprit Nouveau. The problem with him is all the covers look the same. This is also Duchamp, and this is a magazine called The Little Review that came out of New York and then kind of migrated to Paris. The Little Review was the first of the avant-garde magazines that was uh, designed, well, edited and published by uh, women, two women. Most others were male-dominated. And that's another approach to uh, the logo. The logos were changing with every issue, but that's what the constituency, the audience, looked for. Tristan Zara, who was um, the founder of Dada in uh, Zurich, um, got pissed off because he got uh, zapped from the uh, hierarchy of the Dada movement. So he decided to start another magazine. He had started Dada, or uh, Cabaret Voltaire, um, and he did this uh, magazine uh, that was basically a reaction to what was going on in Dada at the time and started the launch of surrealism. This is André Breton, Le Revolution Surrealiste. And this is the anti-revolution surrealist view, uh, which came out of the United States. Uh, Breton is said to have hated this magazine and hated uh, its editor. So what you begin to see is the battle of the magazines. It's kind of like uh, those rock shows where you'd get two rock and roll groups and they'd make as much noise as they can to blur the other one out. This is a great cover for View from Noguchi, which uh, again looks like it could have been done more recently. This is a cover by uh, Miro, Juan Miro, for Transition. Transition was Another term for these magazines was little magazine uh, because they were small, not so much in size, but in distribution. And uh, this was one of the best little magazines. And uh, I once got a letter from Wong Miro when I was doing a little magazine called the New York Review of Sex and Politics. And apparently in his old age, he was reading it and he wanted a subscription. And I didn't know who Juan Miro was. So I wrote back and said, well, you'll have to pay for it, dear sir. <laughs> I was 17. He didn't write back. And I lost the letter, which would have been worth a lot of money now. So screw me. This is Verkman, uh, who was a printer uh, and created his own... Uh, occasional magazine called The Next Call that allowed him to work with letterpress and uh, wood types and letterpress materials. Um, they weren't more than uh, four to eight pages. Um, he also, during the occupation of Holland, uh, ran an underground, a real underground paper, an anti-Nazi paper, and only a few weeks before the war ended, he was found and executed. But they serve as a model for uh, many printer-derived uh, 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 alternatives. Now, a lot of this stuff that uh, I've shown you kind of filters its way into the mainstream. And it filters its way into the mainstream through in, those, in the 20s and 30s, and even to an extent in the 40s, through uh, trade magazines. And I'm going to show you a couple of those. Das Plakat, uh, which was published by a dentist named Hans Sachs. There's a long story behind this that I won't go into, but if you come and 
say, hey, Dr. Heller, uh, tell me the story. I might tell it to you later. Um, there's uh, typographische, and I'm going to mispronounce it, but it doesn't matter. Mitilungen. How was that? It really doesn't matter what you think. But. Uh, this issue it was the anomaly issue. This was the uh, uh, Jan Chikold issue where he basically introduces elementary typography or the new typography. Uh, the issue right before it and right after it uh, were more traditional Art Deco-y kinds of things. Um, uh, so this has become a milestone uh, in that uh, genre. This is an American magazine that introduced modernity to the advertising field. Uh, just briefly, uh, modernity in advertising started with a man named El Ernst Elmo Calkins in the United States. He was an advertising man who believed that art would help sell product and make old products look new, as opposed to repackaging the product or reinventing the product. So for uh, well over a decade, uh, advertising was in the business of making things look modern in an artistic way. This is PM Magazine, which looks very much like some of the uh, avant-garde that I showed you. Uh, this, this is designed by Lester Beale, an American uh, this is designed by Herbert Matter. It's an architecture design magazine. And uh, these uh, magazines are actually in a book that I know is out on the table at SOTA called 100 Graphic Design Journals, uh, Classic Graphic Design Journals, um, that I did with uh, Jason Godfrey last year or six months ago. We move into the 50s and 60s, and in fact, pretty much jump over the 50s, when there were a lot of uh, post-surreal magazines coming out. And that's covered in my book, but not here. But this is one of them from Mexico, which uh, is as surreal as you can get. That's Jean Genet, who I actually met once, but we couldn't speak, because he didn't know English, and I, didn't, couldn't, I wasn't going to embarrass myself with Francais. Uh, but we're going into the 60s. And the 60s was a time that I can still remember uh, where the typography is actually directly influenced by the Vienna Secession and other Art Nouveau motifs. It's also influenced by sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And this was the San Francisco Oracle, which was to be read only if you were tripping. But the typesetting was very difficult, and I can actually tell you from experience how difficult it was because I used to use the IBM MTST printer, uh, a typesetter, which uh, if you knew how to use the uh, automatic part would contour type, although it was laborious to do so, or if you used the manual settings, it would take days and days to do it because the mistakes were prevalent. But this was done on the MTST. Uh, hand by hand, uh, line by line uh, by hand. And this is the quintessential split fountain of that era. Now these magazines, there were tons of them in the United States and abroad, and so avant-garde is, is a questionable term, but the ones that started it were indeed very influential, and the Oracle was one of the first. In Britain, one of the first was Oz magazine, and this is... Uh, the special pig issue uh, that came out after they were busted for the special school, uh, back to school issue that showed these lovely ladies on the cover. And that trial went on for a year in the Old Bailey. And that's an interior spread. Designers were starting to play around with juxtapositions, uh, still using surrealist collage, but uh, playing, uh, the main difference is that photo offset came into play and it made it much easier to work with negatives on uh, a light table and, and create special effects that could easily be printed. Although this one was always a black and white. This is Paul Krasner's The Realist. Uh, this was known as 
this kind of precurses some of the fake news uh, shows that are very popular now on cable TV uh, because there were a number of stories that I won't go into because they're too grotesque even for me. Uh, this was Monocle. Uh, Monocle was a magazine that was satiric, very highly illustrated, uh, but it brought back uh, old wood type into the vocabulary of design. And after Monocle came out, you saw in magazines like Red Book and uh, other lifestyle magazines, uh, slab serif typography and 19th century type coming into play. This is my favorite cover by Tommy Ungerer called Black Power, White Power. And this is a magazine that I worked for, although I didn't do this cover, uh, called The East Village Other. And this represented one of the uh, most well-known of the New York undergrounds. This was the back cover of that. Uh, in a, there were some really interesting artists who were doing work who had come out of the mainstream and decided they much preferred drugs to uh, martinis. And this is Fred McGubgub, real name, uh, who was an animator for commercials on TV. And his animations were actually pretty wild themselves, but he translated them into, uh, into uh, imagery. I'm going to go a little fast here. This is the Chicago Seed. This is the Rat. This is the Gothic Blimp Works, which introduced... This was pre-Underground Comic Book. So first comics came out in underground papers. Then they broke off and had their own com uh, underground papers about them. And then they became comic books and then ultimately graphic novels we know today. And a lot of the people who were pioneers of those came out of this. Uh, the Situationalists in, in France had their own magazine. Opus uh, with uh, uh, some great covers. This was one of the earlier boxed magazines called Aspen. And this was designed by Quentin Fiore, who uh, uh, did uh, the Marshall McLuhan books, Global uh, Village, and War and, Pe War and Peace in the Global Village. Um, and sex starts happening as well. Um, Eros was Herb Lubalin designed and uh, uh, published by Ralph Ginsburg, who actually went to jail for this, in part because... The magazine was filthy and lousy and sex maniacal. But if you look at it today, it's so tame uh, and beautiful, gorgeous. Uh, he, while he was awaiting trial, he said, ah, oh, fuck it, I'll just publish another s magazine that has sex in it. And so he did avant-garde, in which Herb Lubalin was able to play with type. Now it's phototype and lots of things that couldn't have been done in the earlier avant-gardes are being done. Then we jump into punk. Uh, John Holmstrom produced Punk Magazine, where the interesting part about this, aside from defining a movement, is it was all done hand-lettered, everything, every article. So if he made a mistake, tough. And then the British uh, punk was even more raw. This was just done with a marker and somebody with his eyes closed. <laughs> California punk uh, had Slash. And from punk, it kind of segues into what we call New Wave. But this is Wet, which is one of the uh, crazy magazines. It's for gourmet bathers. Uh, but I like the two, the image. This, this kind of introduced John uh, Holmstrom and uh, April Griman into the magazine world. Uh, Raw magazine by Art Spiegelman and Francoise Mouly was a radical shift that focused on comics. Then there were these uh, more intellectual avant-gardists from Cranbrook uh, Academy in the United States who produced Fetish, which led to Emigre, uh, which was uh, the type magazine that starts with bitmap typefaces and moves into... Uh, Barry Deck's typeface and how typography is indeed starting from zero, uh, which goes to David Carson's magazine, Beach Culture, uh, and his special No Emigre Fonts issue. So magazines are still fighting each other. Um, 
and he's playing around with the computer in an early day. Uh, his covers tend to be more illustrative, more Dada-esque, but here's a piece that he did which uh, I know he's happy about, but the writer who wrote it was not, because that's all you got. <laughs> Zap dingbats. Uh, he later went on and did a magazine called Speak, which was taken over by uh, uh, Vines Vineski, but I can't remember the first name, even though we did a book together. Uh, Martin Vineski. And uh, that's where avant-garde tree kind of ended, for me at least. Uh, I'm still looking out into the world to find more, but always remembering that uh, when you use the word avant-garde, remember you're in the past. And this is the book that's out there. Buy a few copies. My son is through college, so I don't need it for that, but for my old age, it would be nice. Thank you very much.